guide your journey into Cabernet Sauvignon magnificence. Hello, welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. Welcome to the hustle and bustle of Oxford Road, approaching lunchtime midweek. And welcome to the Short Market Club, the first of two restaurants that the great Luke Del Roberts has brought up to Johannesburg. Now this one opened late last year. I've been here for dinner, as I'll talk you through a little later. It has a pairing menu that is splendid. Some terrific and inventive food with some wines done just right. And while I might not get it stuck into the entire menu today, I'm certainly hoping to sneak some of the fabulous Del Roberts food. It's one of two spots because right across the way, there is Luke's second restaurant, the one that is literally just opened and that is the Test Kitchen Carbon. And on next week's show, I'll be catching up with Luke to find out why he's come up and how this new incarnation of the Test Kitchen is going to work. But right now, I'm gonna head off somewhere very different indeed, from a rather noisy suburban Johannesburg, instead to Mozambique and to a gorgeous spot in Maputo overlooking the beach. It's the Southern Sun, where I sit down with a rather knowledgeable man about food and wine and eat what is quite simply the best seafood I've ever had. This is the Southern Sun of the Peter Hotel I've been to before, albeit briefly. Last time around, the highlight was Vicky Sampson singing on top of the roof. But this time around, the highlight is sampling a collection of wine with somebody who knows the local fare rather well. It's a paradise of a place to visit behind me, the Indian Ocean lapping gently against the shore, a late afternoon breeze taking some of the sting out of the Maputo heat and humidity. And at just 40 minutes away from Johannesburg, it is a fabulous escape for the scenery alone. But it's not just the scenery, it's the charm and warmth of the locals, it's the history of the city of Maputo, and it is the food and wine for which this part of the world is famous. And not just Piri Piri and stuff with a bit of bite, but some seafood with some accompanying wine. And that is exactly what I'm going to do, not just with some great food and wine, but also with somebody with rather a lot of experience therein. John Rutherford, welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine. Thank you, Dan. Welcome to here. Uh, how do you come to be here? What's your food and wine story? What's your Maputo story? Well, I sort of, um, I used to be a chef before and I changed over to the food and beverage side of the um, thing. And I think um, when I was working at Malone Sun Hotel, that used to belong to Johann Rupert. That's where I really started getting interested in wines. And uh, it just became a bug, you know, where you just really had to improve your wine list and um, select a huge variety of wines for the different palettes that were always coming to the Leopard Creek Golf Course. You've now got a different part of the world with plenty of different palettes, I'm sure. You've got local Mozambicans, there's quite a big expat community here, South Africans like myself nipping over the border, and I'm sure plenty of tourists from other parts of the world. Uh, how does that dictate what you serve here, and what are the food and wine tastes that you serve to? Well, the majority of our wines are South African wines, but um, we tend to have a, 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 a little selection of Portuguese wines on, as well as some Italians. But as I said, majority is South African and tends to go very well with the foreigners and with the, the local Mozambicans. There is uh, some evidence behind both pairs of broad shoulders on screen at the moment that you should have some pretty fresh seafood readily yeah, accessible. Absolutely. Does it come in every single day? Um, we, do, we do bring it in every day. It comes in, we can go down to the um, harbour and we can buy it there or we can go to the local fish market and the chef goes and picks his own lobsters that are coming in early in the morning from the, the local fishermen. And in turn, that means people like me can arrive here and order some of that. I believe your chef's got some stuff ready for us. Yes, he has. Shall, right. we, shall we have a look and see? All right, let's call in the chef. The wine is waiting, but most importantly at the moment, for a slightly famished host of a wine show, there's plenty of food to come as well.
you've uh, you put me in a dilemma here, Mr. Rutherford, because I've told my wife I'm here working. Uh, she's used to me having a bit of wine. If she sees 8% of the Indian Ocean seafood on one platter, just for the two of us, my chances of convincing her this is work ever again have gone out the window. Well, this is only a platter for two people. <laughs> so I'll have to bring her back. And yes, this is absolutely. why I'm back. Uh, this does look magnificent. We've also got three great wines, so I'm going to ask you to suggest a particular wine to, to try the uh, think, particular food. I think with the seafood platter, let's try the Paul Kluver Sauvignon Blanc. Perfect. Um, because it's quite, it goes very well with the um, seafood and um, it's quite refreshing with the seafood. So as a white wine in South Africa, Sauvignon Blanc still tops the sales lists. Uh, would that apply to Mozambique as well? I would say your Sauvignon Blanc. Um, does top that and your Quinta, Abeleda and Carcel Garcia. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. And the first of all is a monthly series of Dan comes to Mozambique and stuffs himself happily. Mmm. Ah. Oh. What I do love about a lot of Elgin Sauvignon Blanc, particularly Paul Sauvignon Blanc, is it strays away from that battery acid, that too much, that Sauvignon Blanc that can strip the inside of your mouth. The acid's still there and it has yes. to be for Sauvignon Blanc, but there is a nice whole mouth feel to it. There is a sense of balance to it, which in some Sauvignon Blancs you, you tend to lose a little bit. Yes, you can actually taste the um, passion fruit coming through yeah. as well as the citrus coming through yeah. in the Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah. It's quite nice. And you know it's also quite nice. You can take a little bit of your Sauvignon Blanc and you can just pour it into your muscles. Ah. You can just um, sort of... Um, just pop it into your mouth and you can actually taste the um, the seafood coming through with the um, stuff in your mouth. Ah. So I'm going to do exactly that. This is John Rutherford's magical suggestion. A little bit of Sauvignon Blanc into my muscle. Here we go. Mmm. You know what it actually reminds me of a little at the very start is that flavor you get from a, a Swiss cheese fondue where you're getting there, you can feel the uh, the burst of, in that case, the kirsch, but the, or the white wine come through yes. um, and then it jumps straight into the ocean. That works really well. It does indeed. Nicely done, Mr. Yeah. Rutherford. <laughs> All right. So clearly it works with one. Let's see if it works with the other. This is, this prawn is the size of a small dolphin and it looks fabulous and even before i eat these there's such a firmness to them yes mm. occasionally you get that slight sogginess when you're eating prawns in the wrong places mm. oh oh that's lovely it's something that speaks to pretty much all the Portuguese food, all the Maputo food, the Mozambican food I've had in my admittedly relatively short time here. And it's a simplicity of flavor. Nothing's over-engineered. It's, not, uh, it's not too complicated. It actually lets the food speak for itself. Yes, lemon butter sauce, a little bit of garlic, and that's it. Now, we've not only got enough seafood for 38 people, should they appear unexpectedly, uh, we've also got more than one bottle of wine. And I see we've got more than one bottle of white wine. What is the other white wine? And is that something that could pair with this particular seafood? That is Quinta Arboleda, and that can also pair with um, seafood. But I always recommend it with the, um, with the um, lobster thermidor, because you'll certainly when you're eating the lobster, you certainly taste the fizziness of that Quinta Abeleda coming through and that burst of fruit coming uh, through as well. It really makes the lobster, it pairs well with the lobster. Okay, that effervescence just bringing it alive yes, and lifting it. Oh. Fresh fish, beach behind you, great wine. I almost think this couldn't get better. And yet, I know we're quite not done yet. Um, as splendid as this is, I believe your chef has insisted on one more dish. Absolutely, and they're waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so despite there being more than enough food to keep us going for another week, there is one more treat in store, some lobster thermidor. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, if Jurassic Park did seafood, that's what's just arrived. Uh, there might be people watching who've heard of lobster thermidor but don't exactly know what it is. Talk us through uh, what you've done to this particular creature. All right, so, so what the chef has done is he's opened up the, the, the lobster, he's taken out the meat, and he's uh, made it with a, a nice cheese sauce and um, put it back in and then sprinkled some cheese and parmesan on top. And that's lobster thermidor. Oh, it always, it's a work of art. It almost seems a desperate shame to carve it up, but I'm too much of a glutton to say no. Before we do try though, you mentioned earlier Just that it was a second wine. So tell me a little bit about this wine as you pour it. It's a Vina Verde. It comes from Portugal. So it's a, it's a green, green um, wine. Um, you'll find it's very, very fizzy. Um, but certainly, certainly does taste well. And it goes really well with the, um, the ladies, especially uh, Casal Garcia and Quinta Abelera. It's light and it's, um, it's fresh and it's really good during a hot summer's day. All right, it's lovely. I'm I'm a fan. Am I a fan though of it with this wine? I'm about to find no, out. Let's try. Mm. Mm. And the answer is yes, John Rutherford. And I'll tell you why, because this is such a big dish that what I find this does is it, just, it sits quite nicely in the background. It's uh, it doesn't get shouted out. Um, but it doesn't try and overpower, it doesn't try and compete with it. It's just a really nice, uh, almost like a palate cleanser. It, uh, it lifts your palate, refreshes it, and back you go in for some more lobster. That's right, and um, it doesn't scream out at you. Um, it just sort of reminds you that it's there in the background. Um, so when you start eating your lobster again, you start tasting different flavors yeah. coming through. Uh, we've had the Vino Verde, and it's delighted in partnership with the Lobster Thermidor. But there is one wine standing a little lonely over in the corner as a finishing touch. Tell me what this is and, and why that sits so proudly well, on your wine list. Stella Kaya um, is a beautiful, absolutely beautiful wine. It's a Merlot. And what I enjoy about Stella Kaya Merlot is that it's a very good drinking wine. Um, normally it's very smooth, very velvety. Normally some of these wines, um, when you're sipping on it, you can feel it at the back of your palate. With this, it is so smooth, it just goes down lovely. And I found it to also go with lobster very well. It's a very, very different pairing, and I quite like it. It brings out, uh, it brings out that meatiness of the crayfish and cheese and red wine are natural yes. counterparts. Uh, and so the combination there, it's probably not one I would have gravitated towards as, um, uh, as adventurous as I like to be, but I'm glad I did because I think it brings out a slightly different dimension. And uh, Ormello is such a versatile grape. Um, I think that works quite nicely. I think so too. And I'm glad you've enjoyed that. <laughs> I certainly have. Last one for you very quickly. Uh, with the kind of temperature, the kind of humidity you have, is this the sort of wine that you're trying to serve with a few degrees taken off, popping this in the fridge before you bring it out to people who, who drink yes, it? Yes, I actually do. I try and get it at sitting at around about 12 degrees, and then I bring it out to the customers. All right. Which just completes my analysis, which is that this hotel is in rather good hands when it comes to food and beverage. Uh, the food's been terrific. Your chef's done a wonderful job. Uh, you've got a lovely setting. I can see why you're quite so happy here. Thank you for the hospitality. Uh, I look forward to coming back and raiding it again in the future. Uh, but for now, John Rutherford and the Southern Sun Maputo, it's been a wonderful time here. Thank you. And thank you, Dan. Hopefully next time we can have a couple of ice cold doujins. <laughs> we look forward to it. Dan really likes beer. There's our new show coming up. Uh, it's been terrific seafood. Uh, and all I'll say to you is, uh, particularly if you happen to live in the Joburg area or maybe you're down in Durban, uh, it's not that long a drive. It's a 40 minute flight from Johannesburg. In you come, clear customs. Uh, 20 minutes later, you're down at the Southern Sun Maputo. Ask for John Rutherford. Tell him you watch Dan really likes wine. You'd like to try the lobster thermidor. You won't be disappointed. It is just a 40 minute flight to Maputo from Johannesburg. And as you can see, it's a cracking hotel. The hospitality of John and Bruce, the general manager, the rest of the team is terrific. And 
How good was that seafood? It is the best seafood I have ever had. Is it the best meal I've had this year though? Well, it does have little competition, principally from this very restaurant. I ate at the Shaw Market Club about two weeks ago, my brother-in-law Fotty's birthday. We had a tasting menu that is full of fun. It's a tasting menu that also includes a cocktail version if you want to do something a little more exotic, but there's also a wine pairing and it's either a local pairing or an international pairing. I went international just for something different, but the local pairing is splendid. And if I look at some of the options you've got, uh, you've got a, a beef tataki, for instance, uh, which has got a wonderful umami, savory delight to it. And you've got a choice there of the Maynard Riesling, a bit of South Africa does Germany, or internationally, some Mirabeau, the rosé out of France. Jump further down, you might want to try the pepper crusted fillet. There you've got either the Ratz Cabernet Franc, Big Brewer, who is as good as anybody in South Africa at producing a Cabernet Franc, or you could head over to America and some Chateau Saint-Michel Merlot out of 2017. It's just a lot of fun, and that really speaks to the ethos of everything that Luke Dell Roberts does. It's fun, he explores, and he loves getting stuck into food and wine. Now, somebody else who loves getting stuck into food and wine is a fellow South African, but one who lives in London, and one who is a regular guest on Dan Really Likes Wine. He's Greg Sherwood. He is a master of wine. He's our greatest wine ambassador in the UK, and this is his story. If there was a silver lining to the two years, which felt like two decades of being in lockdown for South African wine, it was that South Africa's wine story seemed to find a much bigger market around the world as news of our challenges spread and people rushed out to buy South African wine. But while there might have been an element of sympathy to the buying of it, once they'd tasted it, we suddenly had an army of new wine fans around the world. And nowhere was that more the case than in the UK. And leading the charge, our town crier in chief for South African wine is the broad shouldered, bearded gentleman beside me, Greg Sherwood. Welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine. Yes, Dan. Great to be back. Fantastic. For the last, what, two, two and a half years, we've been talking to each other by video call every few weeks on the show regularly. Uh, it's nice to just have you here. How, how long since you've been back in Slavia? So it would have been February, end of February 2020. It's uh, been a while, but it's fantastic to be back. I'm really enjoying it. Well, it's great to have you back as, as one of our great South African wine ambassadors and a, a reminder that you are South African, even though you're now Indeed. ensconced in London, uh, which leads us to this story. How does this South African become one of the, the great London wine voices and such a fabulous advocate for South African wine. It was either a business economics degree or wine, but I, I, I kind of went the commercial route and then uh, discovered my passion later, but it, it didn't happen like that. I, at university in Holland, American University in Holland, I was um, firmly drinking lots of Aranya Boom and Grolsch in Holland and Leiden. And, um, I was just thinking the other day, uh, played golf earlier this week with my dad, and uh, the only time we really drank wine, for my, well, myself, was when we would go, I'd make up a, a four ball with him if a, if a colleague or a work uh, person had dropped out, and uh, I'd be a late four ball, and after the 18 holes, we'd go to the restaurant at this very posh Dutch golf club. Um, Holland's a small country, so golf clubs are quite premium there. And um, we would have some fantastic bottles of what I think is called the Boschendal Grand Cuvée in the, the Sauvignon blend in the very big fancy bottle. And the Dutch absolutely loved South African wine, they always have, even through our difficult years. And um, that was the time when I could uh, drink a bit of wine, but otherwise it was firmly beer. But when I came back to South Africa, um, I had been in, in Washington, D.C. for a year and actually had a very good wine shop across the road. So drank a bit of wine there. Uh, coming back to Cape Town, worked for two years. And um, I just watched all these people working in the wine trade while I was working in kind of finance and accounts and stuff, economics. And I was thinking, God, I think I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Came up to Joburg, uh, worked for five years as a commodity trader in Santon, petrochemicals. Um, you can... Date me that oil price is $24 a barrel <laughs> and not $140 like now. It's a, a great job, but quite stressful, just nonstop. And my escape was studying for wine and studying at the Cape Wine Academy, three year degree. Um, first year or so was in Pretoria. And one of my early mentors was Glinda Yaga, who ran the 
Cape Wine Academy in Pretoria and uh, was a very good friend and enc encouraged me to study uh, and just keep going. Uh, did the certificate prelim, certificate and then um, the diploma. And that I think it all, all about takes about three years in all. And uh, the diploma bit we did in W, uh, well, the Cape Wine Academy here with the um, which now uh, is being run by Heidi Durney. Mm -hmm. really is. And Heidi was doing diploma with me and, and Lynn Woodward actually. Um, and they both finished with me. And I said, well, I think I might want to go back to London and do my master of wine. And they were like, <laughs> crazy, <laughs> crazy. Uh, and they said, well, they might do their Cape wine master as, a, <laughs> as something an as an alternative. <laughs> and uh, Marilyn Cooper said, well, I said, what do you think, Marilyn? What, what should I do? She said, no, look, if you want to work in the international industry, try and do your British Master of Wine. And if you want to work in the South African industry, you know, maybe better to do the Cape Wine Master. Now I realize in hindsight that who I am as a wine professional and a wine taster, judger, whatever, writer, I, I would never have been if I hadn't have had this kind of business career, business degrees, but you know, um, experience behind me. So, you know, I was always so jealous working in Cape Town and looking at these people working in the wine industry. I said, how do you get into this fantastic industry? So really exciting. So you could have been sitting at a desk selling petrochemicals and trading commodities. Uh, I think your life is a little more enjoyable now. It's certainly a space that you're happy with. And it's one that fills multiple roles. We know you're at Hanford and you, you sell so much South African wine. And we're very grateful for that. You also do a lot of writing. You'll find wine safari. You write about wine. Talk to me about the, the challenge of being a wine critic where you've got to a stage now, if I look at somebody like Saki Muton, he speaks about how you pretty much made him with showing Revenge of the Crayfish to the world. You've got that power and the, 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 the Spider-Man world, great power, great responsibility. Uh, yeah. how, how does that weigh on you? How, how much of a challenge is it being a critic knowing that your words have such an impact on a wine? It, it's, it is a big responsibility, but I'd say I kind of dodged the bullet a little bit because um, unlike maybe uh, Tim Atkin or who has a you know very substantial report annually or Neil Martin who does one or two reports here on South Africa, they do the kind of report style uh, uh, reviewing and scoring and basically warts and all. So I, I kind of, I'm not saying I would never do that, but uh, at, at the moment it, it's, I'd much rather look at a specific wine that I think this could be really exciting or it's got a great story like Saki's and really kind of get to the nitty gritty of a wine, the wine character, the personality, uh, the individual, their story and try and, you know, convey that in a kind of interesting way. You know, everyone's got their different style. I like to review a wine and my philosophy was always if somebody's reading it, um, I want them to almost be able to imagine what it would be like to be tasting wine just by reading the note, if, if which, they have some wine knowledge. So. Which leads me to, I think it might have been Duncan Savage talking about you and saying, geez, Greg Sherwood can write a tasting <laughs> note. And your tasting notes are extraordinary. And they almost suggest you've got some kind of superpower because you're able to pick up in wine so much, so many subtleties, so many tiny little notes that would pass most of us by completely. We have a uh, a read and then we test oh yeah actually no there is that uh, that wisp of Finnish gun smoke on an autumn <laughs> afternoon uh, is that just something that you have is it something you can learn is it a combination uh, well I was always told that wine tasting is 70% uh, uh, experience and 30% knowledge and I think that's still pretty much true I would say unless you're like somebody can be tuned deaf and can't sing you can be a little bit uh, palate deaf and just say well i get basic you know wood and i get fruit and i get citrus so i get acid but generally i think most people if you train your palates and you're familiar with you know what things smell like and taste like um it, it's actually just pretty easy i mean we're eating food you smell a oh that smells like a bit of curry you know or a bit of uh, you know this or that i mean you know like on shannon you get that wet straw in the morning you know and i used to horse ride for you know 15 20 years um, and, and I had to tack up my own horse on a cold English morning and you've, you've got the kind of wet bales that just, you know, about to um, line their stables. And, you know, you get all these things and there's, you know, smells and experiences you, you just take on board. So it's just really learning. And I would say, you know, everyone should make a bit more effort because it really doesn't increase your appreciation of wine. 
and enjoyment of wine, which I think is the most important thing. Speaking of Shannon and speaking of Bales, this is Wade Bales' Breda Cliff Shannon, <laughs> <That's a good laughs> which is such a big part of South African wine at the moment. South African wine in London, I spoke at the start about how the last two years have had yeah. at least the one advantage of lifting our profile somewhat and getting more people drinking South African wine. Is Shannon still leading the charge? And uh, where's South African wine sitting as we move into 2022? So I think um, South African wine's on, in such a great space in London, and it's primarily because it's been taken so seriously. Um, from the bottom to the top, you know, on the, on the entry level stuff, Wine buyers are under massive pressure to have really good stuff, whether it's Tesco or Sainsbury's or Waitrose. You know, um, Victoria Mason does an incredible job at, at Waitrose. They all make a really good effort on the, on the entry level, and you know, there's some great, well-priced stuff out there. You know, the mid-market man in the street. I mean, it is just such a golden era for you know, fantastic value for money. You know, the kind of uh, more commercial estates. Um, maybe a lot of some of the, the brands that are more kind of famous in the home market here. And they offer, you know, eight, 10, 15 pounds, 12 pounds, you know, some really, really good value. And then, of course, you know, more in my, um, you know, in the more top end fine wine trade, I mean, the quality has never been better. And just when you think, you know, you taste a wine, you think, wow, you know, we, we've had 2015 and 2017, you know, can't really get much better. And then you taste an, another vintage, a 19 or a 20 or something from barrel or something, you think, my God, this is even better. What are these, you know, how do these guys do it? And it just shows you, you know, how young our industry is and how, you know, what the potential is because these guys are, you know, only just getting going, I think, in, in many instances. My final question to you, Greg Sherwood, Master of Wine, will be absolutely impossible to answer, which makes me even more determined to ask it. In this extraordinary career of yours where you drink and taste and sample wine from all over the world in all sorts of situations, often with uh, all sorts of rather well-known mates, you're having lunch with Alan Lamb one day and dinner with Lawrence Delalio the next. Uh, can you pick Greg Sherwood's all-time favourite wine? It's, uh, I mean, it's that million-dollar question. It's so difficult. And I have to say... Um, it's you know it tastes so many good wines and Romney Conti new releases to older to but there is one memory from just a couple of years ago when I was uh, visiting Piemonte and we went to see Roberto Contorno at the winery tasting his new releases um, and I think we would have been tasting probably twenty well twenty fifteens or fourteens or something and but the Monfortino. His uh, top wine was still the 2010 pre-release, and he had his two little barrels, Botte there, and um, he took it, he said it's about to be bottled, and um, we got a taste of it from, from the barrels, and just the most, I mean, it literally just baffled your senses, the elegance, the seamless balance, the intensity, the focus, the purity, I mean, it's just... It just leaves you speechless, and it's it's a wine. I mean, is it the greatest wine I've ever tasted? I don't know, but it's it's certainly one of the wines that I've reflected on many times and continue to reflect on occasionally. It kind of flashes past you, and uh, so Monfortino twenty ten. I mean, for me, that would be the ultimate uh, hundred pointer. Well, uh, you or I might not have tasted that particular wine, but we do benefit from getting the memories of Greg, the stories he tells and his brilliance at sharing the world of wine that thankfully he's in and not selling commodities from a desk somewhere in Pretoria. So next time you're in London and you're flicking through a wine list and you spot something particularly good, particularly appealing and particularly well-priced because it's South African, you know, it's probably because a guy called Greg Sherwood has made sure that London has become a second home for fine South African wine. So the story of Greg Sherwood, he could have been a commodities trader. He's clearly having far more fun drinking wine and doing such a wonderful job of celebrating South African wine in London. Greg, cheers. And cheers to what looks like a glass I haven't touched. The problem with the Shaw Market Club is every time you look away, somebody fills your glass up for you, which is another reason I like it quite so much. This is Ken Forrester's Shannon uh, Tanashi Nyamudoka, who needs no introduction, has worked both here and at the Test Kitchen Carbon, where we'll be next week uh, working on the wine list. And it is, as is always the case with Tanashi, just a seriously cool wine list, and particularly some really, really nice white wine. 
to pair with some really, really good food. Don't forget on the subject of food that this month's competition, you could win for yourself dinner for four people at Le Coin Francais in France, Chef Darren Bardenorth, and that's in partnership with Bellingham, who'll be providing a range of vintage Bellingham wine for you to try out. It's a terrific prize. Simply go to our social media platforms and tell us why you think you should win dinner with Chef Darren, all five courses for four people with vintage Bellingham wine, and that prize could be yours. That does it for this week, not just from here at the Short Market Club, but also from the Southern Sun Maputo and that glorious seafood and the Dan Really Likes Wine Cellar and Greg Sherwood. I'll be back again next week. In the meantime, keep drinking South African wine, and while you're at it, visit some great South African restaurants as well. Cheers.